my challenge for everyone listening today is go on five females Instagram and leave a positive comment on something that they've done. And could you imagine if we just all left five positive comments to another female, like how uplifting that would be and a perfect way to celebrate today. Welcome to the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I'm Angela Nicholson, and I'm the founder of She Clicks, which is a community for female photographers. In these podcasts, I talk with women in the photographic industry to hear about their experiences, what drives them, and how they got to where they are now. In this episode, I'm speaking with Fujifilm USA ambassador or ex-photographer Caroline Tran, who is a wedding portrait and lifestyle photographer. Caroline was named 2021 Creator of the Year by Rangefinder magazine and is an internationally published photographer, but she started out as a physics teacher with photography as a hobby. Hi, Caroline. Thank you so much for joining me today on the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting because I've heard so much about you. <laughs> Likewise, I'm so honored to be part of this amazing, um, would you call it a society, a club, organization? Community. Community, yes. Thank you. I know you started your working life as a school physics teacher, but how and why did you switch to being a professional photographer? I knew since high school that I wanted to do something creative, but coming from, you know, more traditional immigrant parents, their dream for me was to have a stable life, was to have a boring nine to five, you know, that you can go in, that you know you will be employed for the rest of your life and walk out with a pension and retirement. Right. I think they wanted me to be an engineer first. I decided I don't like the lab. I, I need more creativity in my life. So I thought teaching might be the marriage of my science degree and my creativity. Okay. While it is, I did get to come up with some really creative lessons that I was really proud of. What I realized is that I'm just not a really good employee. <laughs> I'm not a good um, person with routine. I don't follow directions. <laughs> um, I don't take orders well, you know, I'm just uh, not wired for that. And so I was like, I need to be my own boss. I need to be able to dictate what I want to do. And I want a job that doesn't require repetition because I, I'm going to be bored. Like, um, I've never been diagnosed, but I'm positive I have ADHD. Like, and so just that routine lifestyle, like work was really chilling my soul, you know, just in terms of like creativity. And so I dreamt of having something creative and I always crafted on the side. Always, I was sewing clothes, you know, I, I tried to sell my own designs online. The most weirdest thing is I was a huge doll collector and I was sewing doll clothes, sewing doll clothes and then selling them. And this is actually how I learned photography because I started looking and comparing the different clothing that was being sold. And I was like, why are some dresses being sold for like $5.99 online? And yet over here, somebody is selling it for $800 Whoa. and it's selling. Like, how do I get my doll clothes to sell for $800 instead of $5.99, right? Like, so one of the things that I noticed was a strong brand, good photography, and a story to the clothes. You know, when they were photographing, it wasn't just like, here's a dress. It was like the doll in the dress doing something cool, right? So I started, that's how I learned photography. I was like, I need to learn how to photograph these dolls better. And give a story to them. And so I started doing that. My doll clothes, I was able to get up to like $500 for some of my outfits. Um, yeah. And then this was while I was still teaching. And so my coworkers were like, oh my gosh, you take such cute pictures of dolls. Will you take pictures of my kids? I was like, huh, well, you know, the dolls, and maybe I can graduate from dolls to moving dolls, like, as in like babies, like toddlers. So I started photographing kids and I had a lot of fun with that. And so I was like, wow, this is really cool. Around the same time was also when I got married. And that's when I discovered wedding photography. And so when I was done with my wedding, like many brides, I had wedding withdrawals. 
And I was still deep in the wedding community, even though I was no longer a bride. <laughs> and I just thought, if I could somehow be back in the wedding industry now, like maybe I can sew bridesmaids dresses because I had sold my own bridesmaids dresses. Maybe I can design wedding gowns, you know, but at the end of the day, I don't have any manufacturing experience. And at the time, wedding blog, like blogging was a really big deal or a big thing at the time. And there was a lot of like wedding photographers who were blogging. And so I was looking and I was falling in love with like the stories. I was like, how cool is that? That you get to be part of people's stories and documenting their lives. And they share all this with you. That's so cool. So from there, it just kind of merged together. You know, like my photographing dolls became photographing kids, which turned into um my first wedding gig, which was from a coworker as well. It's like, oh, you've been doing such an amazing job photographing all these kids. Um, you photograph my sister's kids for fun and they love it. My cousin's actually now engaged. Would you like to photograph his engagement for like a small fee? And if he likes your work, you know, you can talk about um, wedding photography. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. So at that time, I like got a website up and tried to look professional, looked up what do we need for wedding photography. I was like, oh, I need a 7200. Okay, let me go buy that. <laughs> oh, I need a flash. Let me go buy that. <laughs> and I just quickly learned and then jumped into this engagement session, started shooting it and learning on the job, really. But I realized like I have an eye for this. I have the personality to work with all these people and they love the photos they hired me after to shoot their engagement portrait not just the party um and then their wedding after that and for a long time their engagement party that I shot was my portfolio for a while so yeah just from there I was able to use that get more and more you know through word of mouth and referrals and was able to grow my portfolio how did you feel about that first wedding were you quite confident or were you very nervous I was nervous, but I had so much fun at the same time, you know, like the challenges in it, like was really mentally stimulating for me. And that's what I love. Like, and even till this day, there's no two weddings that will ever be the same. And maybe that's why I enjoyed physics back in the day so much, because it's all problem solving. So on a wedding day, I think that's one of my strengths that I bring to the table, whether it's a commercial gig or a wedding shoot or a family shoot with a fussy child it's problem solving opportunities for me and it's so satisfying when I could think of a way you know especially if it's like creative or innovative that I was like oh, that's such a good idea you know it's like that I was able to get so and so to cooperate right it's like and the fact that most of the problems are personality connection related right like someone's upset or someone's running late and she like so there's a lot of possibilities of how it could be worked out and so it's very fun for me to figure out like what's the best way I can help this person right now. Have there ever been any challenges that you really thought oh no no this is just too much or do you always manage to find a solution and, and carry on? I, oh, I've i always managed to find a solution I mean there's definitely times where in the beginning you're like oh my god what am I gonna do like for example I had a family shoot where the kid was so painfully shy and it was a mini session. So that means they only had 15 minutes booked. Oh. And I had another family coming in 15 minutes. And the little girl, the minute she saw me, she just hid behind her dad and was almost in tears. And the parents were like, sorry, like she's um, a pandemic child and hasn't really been out of the house and seen other others yet. I was like, oh dear, like what do I do? You know? And so at that moment, I'm just like, well, there's no point trying to point a camera at her because that's not going to change anything. So I put the camera down and I noticed that right before I came to her, she was actually on the phone, on her dad's phone. So I was like, oh, what were you watching on the phone? And it happened to be like some show. So then I was like, oh, what? Um, tell me about the characters. What's your favorite character there? And, you know, once then she kind of like slowly peeked out and was like, are you really interested in what I was watching? Like, yeah, tell me more. And then, then she lit up and then, you know, she get, it took five minutes to warm her up. But then I had 10 amazing moments with her and her parents were blown away. They're like, oh my gosh, like we've never been able to have family photos before. And I think at this point she was five. 
I think five or six at the time. And they're like, it was so bad. You know, every time we've tried it in the past, like we've had to just leave. Like the photographers just came up. <laughs> wow. So I guess you're their go-to photographer now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> when you can help a family solve a problem like that, you know, and if their child loves you, then you're in. <laughs> Make it easy for them, I guess. That's the, that's the key, isn't it? Yes. But it, it must be quite hard if you've only got 15 minutes not to keep looking at the clock and conveying your tension or, or you know, your stress that time is running out. The reason why I'm pretty confident with it is that I know I really only need five minutes. Like once I, if I can get the flow going, I can really flow. Like I have a posing system called pick up points and I can really slow through that in five minutes and get all the necessities that I need. You know, that I book them 15 minutes just to give padding, you know, time for chatting, connection. I know 15 minutes sounds like not a lot of time, but you can actually do a lot in that time. So, you know, five minutes chatting, five minutes of really good shooting and then um, connecting after. So sometimes the connecting is like comes in in the form of more creative shots because I've already gotten my necessities. So now let's really play. Or that time might be used to warm up someone who is a little bit more reserved and shy. Is this something that you've worked out through experimentation or have you sort of sat down and analyzed it all and, and sort of put plans together? I came up with pickup points because I remember back in the day when I was doing portraits, every single time I would get so nervous. And then the worst feeling was like, I would start shooting, right? And I get a flow. I start shooting, shooting, shooting. And then all of a sudden I hit a roadblock and I stop. And then I can't seem to remember what I shot and what I still need to shoot. So I'm like, wait. So then I was like, okay, let, maybe let's try a new location or try a new outfit. Okay, start over, right? So then I start over and I'm like, wait, I feel like I'm repeating the same things I just did. Right. So things start to feel repetitive. I start to get a little flustered because I'm worried now, like, oh my God, like, and then how long have I shoot? I have no sense of time now and I don't want to keep looking at my watch, but yet then I'm like, are we done with the shoot? Have I gotten enough for the shoot? Do I call it off? So there was just not a lot of certainty and that drove me nuts, you know? And then I walked away from every session feeling like I didn't do enough. Hmm. So I started to ask myself, like, how can I systematize this? And and I think that's just how my brain works in systems, right? I Even every aspect of my business, I've created systems and processes for. But for portraits, I was like, I think there is a system for this. So I started to think about, okay, what are the necessary poses that I have? So basically, pick up points kind of breaks down into like six common um, starting points. I guess, like, and clusters, uh, they group up the types of poses. And so this was really inspired back in the day when I was playing piano. And I remember I was at a, an exam and I was playing a piece and it, um, it was one of Bach's uh, two-hand inventions. So where your right hand is playing one melody, your left hand is playing one melody. And I was playing and I got like halfway through and I remember like proctors are sitting there watching and assessing me, right? I got halfway through and I remember my mind thinking, I'm getting through this. I think I'm almost done. I think I'm almost done. And my mind being so focused on being almost done forgot what I was doing. And all of a sudden my fingers forgot what they're doing. And I'm like, oh no. So then I stumbled and I look at them and they're like, it's okay, continue. Right. So then I try continuing, but where my right hand is at the beginning of a melody is actually, or at the beginning of a melody is actually the middle for my left hand and vice versa. So I couldn't pick up again. And then the proctor's like, it's okay, move on to the next song. And I was like, oh my gosh, I failed. Like, I have to tell my dad that I failed this year. Um, surprisingly, I passed with honors that year. Oh, wow. But the proctors gave me really good feedback after. They're like, you know, we didn't need you to finish playing it because we could actually tell how well you played it. But where you fell short was that you didn't have any pickup points. 
And to be honest, they might have used a different phrase, but that's the word that I paraphrased in my head. Um, like you didn't have any pickup points. You remembered the song as one long piece of song. So when you got, when you stumbled, you had nowhere in the middle to pick up from. So I realized that's what was happening at my portrait sessions. I was treating my portrait sessions as one hour long sessions. So when I would get stuck, I had nowhere to begin, but back from the beginning again, which then felt like I was repeating all the poses again. So pick up points basically breaks up the sessions into like four 15 minute blocks. And to start, I mean, the variations, the faster you get, you know, mine are probably more like 10 minute blocks now, but there's some flexibility. But to start, let's just for simplicity say four 15 minute blocks. So I group them into six different ones. And so the first four are like my essential ones. These are the four pickup points that I know I have to get to, to know that I have delivered minimally what clients have come and known me for. I think as creatives, the challenge that we run into is that we want to do something creative all the time. We want to innovate and do something new all the time. But on the other hand, as a business and as a brand, consistency is important. So people are actually coming to you because they've been attracted to what you've been doing all this time. So they're going to actually want you to repeat everything that you've already done. So as a as a portrait photographer, I think, and in a wedding photographer, what you have to remember is like, how do I straddle that fine line of delivering them the tried and true poses, the repetitive, you know, stuff that feels repetitive to me, but is what they saw in my portfolio and fell in love with, but also still leaving room for innovating and experimenting and keeping yourself creatively stimulated. So that's kind of how pickup points was built because the first four pickup points are meant to be your essential. Make sure you knock them all out. Some clients are going to have a little bit more warm up time, a little bit more struggle or Let's be honest, some clients you just don't connect with as well. So in those cases, you might only get to those four and that's okay. But at least you could walk out of there feeling good about yourself, knowing that you've hit all the essentials that people have come to expect you for. Some clients, the chemistry is flowing. It was so natural. It's going fast and you are just feeling creatively charged. In those sessions, you might knock out the four really fast and have extra time, then hit up the last two ones that are more creative. And so when I started doing this, that's when I started feeling better about my shoots because I started understanding that not all shoots are going to be those mentally charged, right? And also, I don't know if men goes through this. I've always wondered this, if this was part of our cycle. <laughs> but I feel like just like how we go through our monthly cycles, I go through creative cycles too. Um, and I don't know if it's actually like related to physiological or if it's really just the clients, but I know there are some mornings where I wake up and I'm not feeling that energized, and that charged. And that's a reality too that we just have to deal with. Yeah. But at least with my pickup points, I can rest assured that I will be able to deliver what people have come to me for. And hopefully, something in the session, whether it's chemistry with them or it's the location or it's the lighting that will give me that extra creative charge to want to push beyond the four. But in the worst case scenario, I know that I've at least met the four, the basics, and everyone will walk away happy. That sounds like a really good system. It struck me it's a little bit like we're learning from weddings in a way and utilizing how a wedding is broken up and using that to, to make your portrait session more successful, perhaps more interesting, and just keep, like you say, m maintain that flow because the, the weddings, you know, you've got the, it's broken down to the the preparations and then, the, you know, the ceremony and the rings and all of that sort of stuff. And you, you know, there's those strategic points and photographers often talk about, you know, making sure you've got each of those stages. Whereas I guess it's very tempting if you've got someone coming to your studio, you're going outside to photograph them. It's like, there they are. I've got to photograph them. That's as far as it goes. But I think, you know, your pickup points sound like a brilliant idea. It's worked really well for me and the students that I've taught it to have all said that it's been really game changing. So much of photography really comes down to how we feel. It's a very subjective art. So you could have done the best session and still walk away feeling like, oh, you know, anytime 
you didn't live up to your potential or, you know, or you feel flustered. You walk, sometimes I walk away feeling like, oh my God, what did I even shoot? I can't even remember. <laughs> so I like, I like just being able to walk away knowing like, no, actually I, I know I hit up these, these points. And then that allows me to confidently at the end, tell my clients like, that's a wrap. That was amazing. You know, versus like, I think, I think we shot enough. <laughs> I've run out of ideas now. <laughs> Never sounds right, does it? <laughs> right. <laughs> so on the days when you wake up and you're not feeling particularly you know, energized or creative, do you rely on your pickup points or do you have any other techniques that you use to kind of get you up and going? Um, sunshine makes a really big difference for me. Maybe I'm like half plant, <laughs> but... <laughs> light inspires me so if it's a gloomy day like I might just be in bed all day if I don't have to get out right but if it's an outdoor shoot show up early and just immerse in being there can help energize me if it's a um, indoor shoot and if it's just bad weather then some physical activity actually help like jumping you know like if I can get my heart rate up, then I actually feel better as well. So a lot of my creativity, and I don't think I'm alone on this, but so much of my creativity is dependent on my own mood. And I think everything we photograph is somewhat a mirror of our own experiences and um, emotions as well, right? And so meditation also helps sometimes just taking, you know, even just five minutes before the session to just tune out all the noise that's happening in your head to be present but without fail like once I see my clients then I'm energized by them like just meeting them trying to get to know them and just like how I was saying if they tend to be shy and and connection is hard if I'm feeling kind of not connected whether it's because of them or because of me my own mood uh, I don't pick up the camera right away and just try talking to them first and reach a point of connection. And usually there's something there that will invigorate me. I was just thinking while you were talking there about jumping, I know that I started going to a gym a while ago and on the days when I go to the gym in the morning, okay, you know, that's probably an hour and a half out of my day by the time I've gone there and done the training and come back and all that. But I get so much more done because I am energized, you know, so I can see the point, but it must be, um, yeah, it must be interesting to walk into a photographic studio and see the photographer jumping up and down. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened. I, I, I did a reel about that because during my mini session, they're booked 20 minutes apart. They're 15 minute sessions, but I give a five minute buffer in between. Oh, that was the point I forgot to mention earlier. That's also why I'm not worried because I know I have that five minute buffer in between that I could spill over if needed. Okay. Most people don't need it. So there's a lot of room to catch up at some point. We had a little, like a short 15 minute break for my staff in between. And so we started dancing. Uh, We're like, let's record a dancing reel, a TikTok. So, you know, we had our phone out. We were, you can picture me standing on top of this four foot tall present. My assistants are all like spread out inside the other presents. And we are dancing to some trending TikTok dance. And then the client walks in the door. It's like, hi. (laughs) Are we in the right place? (laughs) It was a great icebreaker. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. (laughs) Now, you've mentioned social media. I know you are very active on social media. Obviously, you've got your photography business and you do quite a lot of training as well. So how do you manage to balance all of that? Because, you know, you kind of need to keep your photography business going because that's your core and that's what keeps you in the creative side but also people are desperate to learn from you so you know you're in demand for more more workshops and then you've got your social media to kind of like feed all the time how do you balance all that plus you've got two kids I've always loved teaching I mean like I mentioned when I was a teacher I loved teaching you know teaching high school I think I just didn't like repeating the same class five times a day the same topic five times a day And I didn't like being forced to wake up at the same time every day. But the teaching itself, I loved and thrived on. And so when I became a photographer, um, I just naturally also wanted to help other photographers. You know, with anything that I learned, I would be so eager to share it with somebody else. And 
I think it was 20, 2010 or 2009 was the first time that I started teaching an in-person workshop. And it was so much fun. You know, there'd be anywhere from nine to 20, like, yeah, I think the lowest we had was nine. The most we had was 20, 25 people come. And it would be class, you know, a combination of classroom style, hands-on experience. And I loved it. But they were very expensive, very expensive to host as well, right? Like I had to rent the venue, feed them, you know, and I'm trying to give a good experience too. So my thought was like, how can I scale the education to reach more people? So that's when I was like, I want to do online courses. I want to start recording some of my courses. Now, the problem I was running into is how do I find the time to not just write the course, because that takes time to write it, um, record it, film it. And then the part that took the most time is actually like the logistics behind it all, setting it up on, you know, whatever program you choose to do, the marketing for it, the email list and the funnels and all that, right? And I remember meeting with the business coach at the time, and he had asked me, what is your dream? Like, how would you like to see your time split, like your income split? And I was like, well, I'd love to make 50% from teaching and 50% from shooting. He's like, okay, that's great. Um, How much percentage of your time is spent on each? I was like, well, 90% shooting, 10% on education. He's like, okay, do you see the discrepancy now? Like, how are you going to be able to make time for the education if you're spending all your time shooting? So it took me about 18 months. But before launching online courses, what I did was, how do I streamline my photography business so that I'm not spending so much time in it? So that's when I started to streamline like systems and processes. I created things for everything on the back of my business. So the goal was that how can I spend less time on the business side of my photography? You know, what do I love most? I love most is shooting and working with clients. I love creating art. What do I not like? I don't like managing the invoices, the contracts, um, the booking, the inquiries, you know, emails, right? Like, and then a lot of the stuff, like, I can't access my gallery or like, how do I download my photos again? Like stuff like that, right? Like, I don't want to deal with that album design. That's the stuff that like was taking up my time that didn't bring me joy. So I created systems and processes for all of that. So I'm at a point in my business now where I really only spend time on photographing and, um, marketing but even with marketing it's on a high level of marketing you know i have like video editors i have my editing is all ai nowadays so it's very fast and streamlined i did have an editor before but ai came out and took over um album design is somebody's in charge of that and even that is like heavily ai too and so once i was able to make my photography business not take up so much of my time, it freed up more time to do other things. So for the pandemic year, that's when I chose to really focus on education and was able to launch that. A lot of the courses are now up and are automated as well, like self-checkout, and people are able to do that. And so this, what felt really good was this past summer, I decided that I'm going to not work additionally, like not put in more time and just spend the summer with my kids. You know, the oldest one just turned 13. That means I have five more years before he's off to college, you know, and that and that's going to fly by. We know how fast five years fly by. So I was like, I'm going to from now on take, I've always taken between um, our Thanksgiving, which is end of November to New Year's off. So I don't work for those I think it's like six weeks or something. I get on holiday mode, family mode, and I'm just completely present with my kids. Um, I I make all of my clients aware of that so that they know to get their holiday sessions in beforehand. So as a result, like October, for example, I could easily be photographing 100 
families in October. In November, the first week of November, I do my holiday mini session and we'll do like 70 sessions in one weekend. And then I'm done after that. I can enjoy the holidays with my family. Very nice. Same thing with summer. It's like, how can I plan to have this three months off? Let me streamline as much of it as I can, you know, and um, once you have these systems in places, the nice thing is that they're like a matter of switches and dials. You can choose to dial up when you want to or dial back when you want to. And it's it's made it really nice for uh, balance because at any point I could say, okay, this month is going to be dial up, dial up the let's say portrait sessions, let dial back the education. This month um, is conference season. Let me dial up the education, dial back the portrait session. This month, I actually want to take some personal time off. So let me just dial these things back and then do spend time with my kids. Fantastic. I can see why it would take you 18 months to go through your business and sort of streamline it all and work out your processes and get it all on track what a worthwhile time it is and so luckily i was documenting a lot of that process and then i ended up uh recording it into a class so that that course is called like nobody's business and it's been like a game changer for so many photographers but i broke down the process of how i streamline my business so that others can do it including the spreadsheets and the workbooks you know to make them because the reality is my ideal business might look different than your ideal business and that person's ideal business, right? My ideal business when I didn't have kids looked very different than my ideal business now that I have kids. (laughs) (laughs) I can imagine, yes. (laughs) Oh, that's fantastic. Do you think you could extrapolate your, your teaching to other businesses or are you at the moment at least, is it wholly focused on photography? It's absolutely applicable. And when I was launching this course uh, with my branding person, that's what I was asking because I was like, this really applies to any small business. You know, it's the idea of building a business that revolves around the lifestyle you want. And I think one common thing that, and I think social media is to blame for this, but a lot of people tend to think that there is one model of what they need to achieve. Right. Somebody is on social media right now showing off how amazing their business is or life is. And then you think that's what I have to do. So you see this person traveling the world shooting stuff and you're like, oh, my God, I have to be a destination photographer. Meanwhile, you see someone shooting commercials. Oh, my God, I need to be booking commercial gigs. Oh, my gosh, I need to be um, teaching. Oh, my gosh, I need to be shooting babies. Oh, my gosh, I need to be shooting celebrities. Right. Like you everyone's showing off the best parts of the business. And then you think that you have to be doing all that. And so what the core of like nobody's business is, is that it is like nobody else's business. It's going to be your business. You need to sit down and ask yourself, what do you want? Because if you want to be doing destination weddings, that's a very different lifestyle than somebody who, for in my case, for example, I did, I did start off as a destination photographer, did a lot of them, traveled a lot, but soon I had kids and realized, wait a minute, my kids are going to start school one day. I can't just like pick up and leave. Also, I have aging parents. I want to be around my parents. I want to be able to enjoy, you know, them as much as I can while they're healthy. So I shifted my business model to be something that was more, um, that allowed me to be home more. So this idea is that one, to, to shed the weight that, external forces may be putting on you and start back to your heart what do you want what's what are your values is it family is it friends is it traveling is it fame is it money right everyone's motivated by different things but once you can tap into your heart and say how do i define success how do i know that how will i know if i'm on the right track right so we list out those things what does that look like So now let's build a business that gives you that type of lifestyle and don't mind all the other noise. So to answer your question, yes, it applies to any small business, but from a branding perspective, I was advised to keep it more niche um, to make marketing easier. Yes, I can see that. Absolutely. 
For a slight change of tack, um, you're a Fujifilm USA ex-photographer or ambassador, as we tend to know them. How did that actually come around? And what sort of impact has it had on your career? Yeah, so that one was uh, a great story, too. So I started off shooting medium format film. My favorite film stock back then. So I used to shoot with the Contact 645. And my favorite film stock was, well, to date myself, <laughs> um, it was Fuji um, 800Z. So that was like my favorite film stock. They eventually discontinued that. Then I switched to 400H. And at that time, I was, they reached out to me and asked if I was willing to speak on the Fuji film stage about my film workflow. And I've, I've always been like hybrid to some degree as well. I was more heavily filmed back then, but they wanted me to do a talk on the stage about my hybrid workflow and how I'm, you know, incorporating my Fuji 400H with my digital work. And, um, they wanted me to share this at WPPI. And I thought, yeah, I'd be honored to love to. But then I thought about it. And at the time, I was like, the GFX had, was still new at the time. Like, and I told them, I was like, okay, I was like, I could get up there and speak about my workflow. But currently, I'm shooting with a different camera brand. So if anyone asks about my digital work, it's going to be all a different brand. So do you want to send me a GFX in the meantime? so that I can start building a body of work with the GFX so that when I'm up there comparing my digital and film work, it's going to be also with the Fujifilm. So they're like, okay, sure. So they connected me with the GFX side and they sent me one and then I just fell in love with the camera. And after that, I'm like, I need to keep this. Like, how can I keep this? Like, I don't want to give it back to you now. Yeah. <laughs> so then, uh, but from there, we started having a relationship. Nice. I'm guessing that must have been around, what, 2017, something like that? Or was it? Because wasn't the GFX launched in about 2016? Yeah, I think it was 2016. So at that time, I was doing both, working with both. But then eventually, they, you know, the film got discontinued. <laughs> but yeah, ever since I started picking up the GFX, though, like, I just didn't have the need for film as much because I was getting such similar results already. And it slowly, I slowly weaned off of film. It was a very, very gradual process. And I still have my contact 645 and I still occasionally shoot with it. But the reality is I don't really need it. And I'm all for carrying as light as possible. I'm typically a one body, one lens person. I'm just done with being weighed down. You know, back in the day, I used to think you had to wear double camera straps two cameras plus bags extra lenses you know the more lenses you have the more legit you have right and also because that's what all the guys are doing so and those are the role models back then you know I'm like okay I guess I have to be like them and now I'm just like no I'm gonna save my back <laughs> I want to be in this for the long haul so let's be minimalist perfect anyway this episode is going to go live on the 8th of March which as we know is International Women's Day and the theme this year is to inspire inclusion, which is very exciting. What challenges do you think women photographers still face today? And how do you think the photography community can work together to address that? I experienced this a lot more early in my career, um, but I actually just experienced this even last night. Like if I have a male assistant and I walk into work, they often assume that he is the lead. And I am the assistant. If it's people who don't know me, right? Like if I'm walking into like, and that this happened a lot early. Like now they, a lot of venues and planners know me. So I don't experience that as much now. But when I was, but even yesterday, it was a casual event, photography event I went to. And same thing I noticed. It's like, huh. Um, so I just quiet, like the way I dealt with it last night is I just quietly like went along with it and. And then they, I eventually got stage time to go up and talk. And the minute that I talked, I was able to command presence. And then everyone after that was interested in hearing more from me. Um, but on wedding days, for example, um, I, and maybe, I don't know if this is like a good or a bad thing, but I purposely dress nicer to not look like the help. So I will come in, I mean, 
comfortable enough to work, obviously, you know, so it's still flats, but they're cute flats and it's a cute dress. Yeah, still very professional, right? But I purposely try to look more like the boss versus the help. And I know that's a very superficial solution, but um, but it, it is. But I do find that the way I dress does affect how I carry myself as well. So the more formal I'm dressed, the more professional I'm dressed, I think I just tend to have that air in me as well versus if I come in like sweats, you know, then I'm feeling more like a teenager or whatever. So um, that's one way. I think the way that we can support each other is the community, like what you're doing with She Clicks, you know, refer each other, talk, play up each other. Um, you know, the best versus you being out there bragging about your own self like if a colleague is bragging about you that holds more weight so if we can do that for each other right with if there's an opportunity to refer someone refer a female if there's a chance to hire a second shooter hire a female i love having an all-female team when when possible sometimes there's a shortage unfortunately and you know but i will as much as i can hire um females because I just love that energy there was a time where my team was just four females and it was so much fun you know like the connection that we had the bonding time that we had the team development that I was able to do with them because we were all females like the sleepovers and stuff like that and you know that kind of community is unique when it's all females yeah that sounds like a lot of fun too I, it is really important, I think, like you say, to to big up your colleagues, your friends who are also photographers, because I'm not going to speak for you, but maybe you don't. But most people at some point have imposter syndrome and it's all too easy to have 10 people say you're great and one person says you're not and you listen to that one person. So the more people you can have supporting you and saying, well done, I think you're great at this, you're doing a really good job, the better it is. And also, actually, you know, if you say something nice to somebody... It makes you feel a heck of a lot better than saying something bad too, doesn't it? It does. You know, it, it's contagious in that way. And my challenge for everyone listening today is go on five females Instagram and leave a positive comment on something that they've done. And could you imagine if we just all left five positive comments to another female, like how uplifting that would be and a perfect way to celebrate today. Brilliant. Yes. We'll put that challenge out. Comment on five women photographers' Instagram accounts. Brilliant. Okay. So in the spirit of International Women's Day, what message would you like to share with aspiring female photographers? Gee, so many ideas or so many things. But I would say to not measure your success based on other people's benchmarks. You know, you don't know what their personal situation is like you only know your own and so define success for yourself and only measure your success based on those criteria write it down somewhere so that you don't forget because it's easy to forget so write down you know what are the three I'd say no more than three write down like three measures of success for this I do this um, for the year at the start of the year, I do this, but also every quarter. So right now would be a great time for quarter two, like to start thinking about quarter two. What's three things that you would want to accomplish? And just keep your mind on that and don't worry about all the other noise. Also know that these criteria can change throughout your life situation. So for example, um, when you, if you are a new mom, it's going to look very different than when you are suddenly an empty nester. Or if you are single, you know, and have no one to answer to, it's going to look very different than when you are now married. Yeah. So take those changes into account. Great point. Now, speaking of international women, you are going to be coming to the UK very soon and you're going to be on the feature film stand and the She Click stand at the photography and video show. Yes. Fantastic. Birmingham NEC. So can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing? Yeah, so I'm going to be um, speaking on the Fujifilm stage about my baby portraits, you know, my transition from weddings to portraits, how I was able to make it very profitable 
you know, back in the day, a lot of wedding photographers used to think like, oh, like you don't make any money in portraits, you know, like, as like, actually, what I found is I made more money with portraits than weddings and less work. <laughs> and so I'll be sharing a little bit about that, my approach to that and how I really tapped into like the babies under one market and made it work for me and how that fits with um, being a mom. So I'm able to work while my kids are in school. And then I'll also be at the She Clicks booth every day. So you guys got to come and visit me and say hi. Yeah, definitely. And if time permits, I'll be shooting headshots. So come and get some new profile photos for your social media. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be great. Please excuse this interruption. This podcast is supported by Fujifilm, one of the best known photography brands in the world. Fujifilm's award-winning X-Series and GFX system cameras and lenses are suitable for all types of photographers and videographers. Each has been developed utilising experience gained for more than 90 years in the industry, featuring the unique film simulation modes that everybody knows and loves. Okay, let's get back to the show. So I think it's probably about time that we went to six from SheClicks. Now I've got 10 questions from SheClickers. And I would like you to answer six of them, please, by choosing numbers from one to ten. Uh, seven. Number seven. Well, it's interesting. You've touched on this a little bit, but this is from Caroline. She says, do you have any suggestions about how to engage a child where asking them about their favorite show, book, game, character, etc., has failed to entice them out of their shell and they're simply too shy to talk or be photographed? Getting down to their level really helps. Um, and sometimes it's waiting for them to come out if there is a little stuffed animal you can talk to them through the stuffed animal as well so i have one on hand just if i need you know and you just bring it out and it's like this is mr bunny you know and mr bunny likes apples like what do you like so th that's one way to do it um sometimes just observing the child and seeing what the child wants to do first and sometimes having I find that having little kid chairs really help. For some reason, they just love the little furniture. So I might be like, oh, do you want to try sitting in this little chair? And I just happen to put it in the set. But it's like, look at this cute little chair. Like, I love, And then I have uh, uh, these ghost chairs, like clear acrylic chairs that I like to call the invisible chairs. And so it's like, this. have you seen my invisible chair? I think it's over there, but I can't tell. It's like, do you think you could sit in it or do you think you might fall through it? I don't know. <laughs> so giving them challenges like that, that they, they really enjoy. Or having, um, if I have mom, like I might include the parents initially while they're still re trying to warm up. So I may have mom or dad sit in the set and then I'm mean, asking like, can you help me give this to your mom? Like give this whatever it is, right? But kids like to be helpful as well. So if I can engage them in that way and helping. Some kids like to look at the back of the camera. So I might have them like, do you want to help me take a picture of mom? And have them come back and like let them push the shutter. Some ideas. Hopefully one of those will stick. In general, though, I know it's it's tempting, but resist busting out the screen. Because a lot of times when parents get flustered about the kids not cooperating, they'll want to bust out the cell phone and or, or the iPad and put on YouTube. But I actually found that that doesn't help. And then when you try to pry it away from them, it's just an, it's even worse. So, you know, I know it's good intentions, but I had not found it to be successful. Okay. So can I have your second number, please? Let's go with six next. Number six. The thought of doing wedding photography fills me with dread as so many things could go wrong. What strategies and workflows do you use to ensure that everything goes to plan as far as possible? Well, we know, don't we? <laughs> Yes. And step number one, don't expect it to go exactly as planned. Um, but there are things that you can do to ensure it to be as smooth as possible. First of all, I know exactly what shots I need and when I get those shots. So just like we talked about earlier, my wedding day is broken up into parts. Sometimes they, they come in different order, but more or less, there's always going to be the getting ready. There's going to be the bridal portraits, the couple port uh, wedding party portraits, right? Couple portraits, family portraits the ceremony itself, cocktail hour, and the reception. 
So I know what has to happen within those times. So for example, the cocktail hour is when I ha- was also the same time that I'm getting all the detail shots of the empty ballroom and the decor. The getting ready is also the same time that I'm shooting all of their flat lays, like their jewelry, the perfume, the shoes, invitations, and things like that. And I know approximately how much time I need for each of those. So I ask for their timeline in advance and I make sure that I have the time I need. A lot of times where I find they underestimate is transition time. So they'll say something like getting ready, you know, at 11 o'clock, um, first look at 1130. And I was like, what happened to like, getting everyone up and moving out of the room and walking to the first look location and setting up, right? Like that part is like the invisible part, right? Just the walking and getting to places takes time. So I will bring that to their attention. I don't ever like demand it. I find that the best way to approach it is to give them a picture of what it will look like if they did this. So for example, for someone who doesn't want to do a first look, or can't decide if they want to do a first look or not, then I'll say, okay, well, if you do a first look, then you we can potentially move your getting ready earlier and give a lot more time for your portraits after, which means that we can hit up multiple locations. If you don't do the first look, then that means that right after your ceremony ends, we have about half an hour before guest starts to get seated. So in that half an hour, it's whatever we can shoot, you know, will probably right be, be right at your altar. So then I let them decide from that point on what they think is the best option. If they want to get ready, say, at a hotel that's 30 minutes away versus getting ready at maybe spending a little bit more to get a room in where they're actually getting married, yeah. you know, then I say, okay, well, if you, get, if you get ready at that hotel over there, then, you know, we'll lose, we'll have to, pack everyone into a car drive over here possibly lose some people along the way you know but so give extra time for that so we'll have to start this extra early but if you get ready here then I can meet you here ready you know you can do most of your getting ready there but come here to put on your dress so I lay it out in that way and for the most part it becomes clear what options they should make yeah but I think that's one of the ways that you'll at least be able to control the flow of the day. Now, do things run late? Yeah. There's going to be things that are beyond your control. Like sometimes the makeup artist came late and now their um, hair and makeup is not ready for an hour later and your portrait session is cut short an hour. So what I'm doing at that time is monitoring it and quickly making adjustments if needed. So I'll look at the timeline and I'll tell the coordinator like, okay, so I don't think we're going to get to do the portraits before the ceremony after all because, or We're not going to be able to do all the portraits. How about we do just uh, this one and then we push these two to be after the ceremony instead. Looks like sunset's a little bit later. So how about during the reception when salads are dropped, I can pull them out for a couple pictures here and then. So it's it's all problem solving during the day. Yeah. So it's got have a plan, but be prepared to adapt it. Yes. And I think if you can establish like a good relationship with their planner or with the couple even to just trust you to make changes as needed during the day then you'll you'll have a lot more control and flexibility right could i have your third number then please number eight number eight you're going in order interesting okay what keeps you shooting film and prompts your choice to use it on a particular day that's from liz most of the time i will shoot film when i want to take it slow when i want to connect slow down the pace a little bit. And I just, I love the experience of shooting film, you know, because it's, you don't get that instant gratification. So it's really between, it's like a, this relationship and chemistry mm-hmm. between you and your subject and the camera at that moment. And so most of the time it's um, female portraits that I will shoot film with that I love. And then also couple portraits. So during an engagement session or during the couple portraits during a wedding day I'll do is that because there's a different aesthetic to film it is it's um the softness to it it's quiet if if you can describe 
a photo as quiet. But that's like the moments that I like to shoot with film. It's kind of like these quiet. I mean, even when I talk about film, you notice I slow down in my talking. <laughs> yeah. It, it just, it calms me. Right. And I find that if I'm trying to create something that's more romantic, something that's more um, calming, that's what film does for me. And that's the kind of portraits that I'm trying to create with film. Okay. That's interesting. Can I have your fourth number then, please? Nine. Number nine. Right. Okay. This is an interesting one. What, if anything, makes you pick up your camera when you're not working? One fun fact is I do not carry my camera around if I'm not paid to. (laughs) So most of my life is documented on my iPhone. But I think I do a really good job with mobile photography, though, in, in all fairness. But what I will pick up my camera for um, when I'm not paid is photographing my family or, for example, my kids' uh, my kids' birthdays. I'll do like a birthday shoot for them, a fun birthday shoot for them. And then also my parents. So I'll make them during some of the, when we have our family gatherings, I'll, I will have the studio set up and make everyone jump in for pictures because I think those are the, you know, of all the pictures that I create and as beautiful as some of the other stuff I love, I think at the end of the day, the most meaningful ones are going to be the ones of my own family. Yeah, I'd agree. They're the most important, aren't they? Do you sort of turn into a photographer when you're, you know, that you're at the kids' party? And suddenly you think, oh, if they just did this, it would be a really great photo. Do you start directing a bit or do you just let them get on with it? Um, For the most part, I let them go with it. But there are certain parts, like the cake. Like I'll get in there and, you know, try to get that creative shot or like the depth of field. It's all with my phone, though. Like most of my kids' lives are documented on my phone. Right. Um, Not to say that they're bad photos because they're still good photos, like professional looking photos just on the yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. all in the composition. But I'm really good at picking and choosing my battles too. Like if it just looks like too much effort or like I'll just disrupt everything, then it's just more documentary, you know. I like what do I really want to remember? I want to remember the people who are here and what things look like. Um and my kids' expressions when certain things happen. Yes. Yeah. Those are the important things. So your penultimate number then, please. Uh let's go two. Number two. What are your favorite sorts of wedding locations and your nightmare locations? <laughs> Ooh, I love open space. I like having a lot of space to work with. I love open air, um, natural light, I think is just where I really thrive. And again, I think that's just my affinity for sunlight. Um, so like vineyards, beaches, anything outdoors and big is like my dream nightmare would probably be anything that's really tight because i think i'm slightly claustrophobic so if i'm in like a tight enclosed space that would give me a little bit of anxiety also i love shooting with long lenses so being in a tight space you know i'd have to be on a wider lens which isn't my preferred view perspective i guess my preferred perspective i'll still shoot it you know you put a you can do some creative lighting in there and get some cool dramatic shots but it's not what would make my heart sing i think outdoor weddings are a bit more popular in the states than they are here but that's largely down to the weather (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) okay so your final question your final number please go five number five uh oh so several people ask this actually and it probably will come as no surprise what's your usual wedding photography kit and if you could only take one lens, and I know you said you do like to shoot with just one lens, what would it be? Yeah, so my wedding photography kit, my work, my main workhorse is my Fujifilm GFX 100S. My backup camera is my Fujifilm GFX 50S. But I rarely use both at the same time, so it's more in my bag as backup. So on the 100S, I start the day off with either my 80 millimeter 1.7 um, or now would pro- would be the 55 uh, millimeter 1.7. And that one, those are great for being indoors. You know, it's the 55, especially now is 
the 80 was a little bit long. And sometimes I found myself shooting from inside a closet or on top of the toilet to get my angles. But the 55 now is like just wide enough that I don't, that I'm able to get most, most of the room. It's also great for my detail shots if needed. So I'm pretty much able to handle the whole day on that. Um, I usually will have, if I have a assistant, which I usually do, I would have her carry a, a Fujifilm X-T4, which recently just got upgraded to the Fujifilm X-H2S. So that one will have um, the 16 to 35 on it. I don't shoot a lot with it, so I, that's why I have her carry it. But it's just in case of those moments where suddenly there, there's like a bum rush of family that comes in and they're like, get a big group picture of all of us. And you know, it's like a tight space and I need that wide shot. So I have that ready in case needed. But um, but mostly it's the 100S with the 55 or formerly the 80. So then from there, I move on to portraits and my portraits will still be on the, will be on the 80 1.7. And I, at that point, I have my assistant now bring out the 45 to 100 F4. And that one is because in case big group shots, I'm ready for that. And also big scenic shots. So if I'm trying to do the bride and groom in like a big, you know, capture like the whole estate or something, right? then I have that wide lens readily available. But my portrait itself will mostly be on the 80. Um, the ceremony is also with just those two, the 45 to 100 on one body, and then the 80 on another body for more beauty shots. That carries me all the way through the reception. And then after the first dance is when I'm ready to ditch all the weight. And then I'm down to my um, either the X-T4 or the X-H2S with either the 16 to 35 if it's still like you know a lot of fluctuations in what's going on or I might just switch to the 23 and then I'm able to do you know dancing shots and stuff with that and that's kind of the rundown of the day (laughs) and if you could only use one camera and one lens which would you go for it would be the Fujifilm GFX 100s with either the 80 it's been the 80 1.7 forever but the 55 1.7 is really like close there. Now it's there. Yeah, the 55 gives me just a little bit more of an angle, but the 80 is like a little bit more flattering. So it's a toss up either way. Okay. I'm interested that you stuck with medium format, you know, because, well, the extra bulk weight, but the quality is amazing, isn't it? And that, that lovely sort of shallow depth of field that you can get when you want it. The compression, like in the depth of field, is just, so beautiful and especially when you're shooting at like 1.7 on a medium format just the bokeh is buttery creamy well caroline thank you so much for joining me today it's been really lovely speaking with you and i can't wait to meet with you in person at the photography show very soon likewise i can't wait to see you all so uh when i see you in person i want to uh, be able to have seen that you did the five comments on female photographers instagram posts so your, your whole work today is to go and comment on five females Instagram posts and then start thinking about what you want to wear for your updated profile photo. Good point and good reminder about the challenge. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. You'll find links to Caroline's social media channels and website in the show notes. I'll be back with another episode soon. So please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and tell all your friends and followers about it. You'll also find She Clicks on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube if you search for She Clicks Net. So until next time, enjoy your photography. <laughs>